Thank you for joining us. The following presentation is from a webinar titled Taxation of Trusts and the Vital Importance of Selecting the Proper Trust Situs, originally produced on November 19th, 2015. The presenters are David Warren, President and CEO at Bridgeford Trust Company, and Tyler Wanger with McConley and Asbury. Enjoy the presentation and visit us online at www.macpas.com for more information about our future events and upcoming webinars. And David, before we begin, I just want um, to do a quick introduction for you because I know you probably won't do one for yourself, but some of the callers on today's call might not realize that not only are you the president and CEO of Bridgeford Trust Company, but you're also on the board of directors and you also are one of the co-founders of Bridgeford Trust Company, the organization, um, which is uh, pretty impressive if you ask me and we're definitely excited to have you on here, but you also have 18 years of professional uh, experiences in practicing law and working in the financial um, services industry, such as um, trust management, wealth management, and uh, wealth management for those of high and ultra high net worth families um, across the nation. So we're super excited to have you today and we're eager to hear what you have to say. So uh, go ahead and get started. Thanks, Tyler. We're happy to be here and uh, excited to talk about the, uh, the topics that we're going to go over today. Um, the title, of course, sort of speaks for itself. Um, the presentation is going to focus on jurisdiction generally in terms of making the proper jurisdiction selection when you're uh, engaged in the wealth planning process. It's a topic that we're particularly passionate about at Bridgeford because we think it really makes a huge difference uh, and has, can have a huge impact on the plan. Now, there's a quote that you see uh, that has really driven a lot of the reasons as, as to why we built Bridgeford the way we did, and, and it guides us in many ways in terms of our, our discussions with clients and attorneys and accountants around the country and increasingly around the world. And you know, the choice of a state in which to establish a trust is as critical as the decision to create one in the first place. And I think that's more true now today than it ever has been because as we're going to talk about in the next uh, hour or so, there are particular factors that really make a tremendous impact relative to um, certain planning techniques uh, that, that are available to planners around the country. And again, not only around the country, the U.S., but even around the world. Um, I recently spent uh, over two weeks in Europe talking about U.S. trust law and, and uh, meeting with attorneys and accountants and, and financial people, uh, many of which are on this call today. So it's good to see my new friends uh, uh, from Europe join us, uh, as well as friends from around the country. Uh, we have states represented from California to Florida to Massachusetts, and I appreciate you participating, and uh, it's good to see you on the call. But this decision, again, uh, as to where to place a trust, has just become vitally important. And I think that from we'll, we'll go with that paradigm throughout the, throughout the hour discussion. So it's really exciting to watch this um, sort of evolution. When we got started to, or got started the process of launching Bridgeford, it became very clear that there's a, a, an amazing race going on right now among four states to be the top trust jurisdiction. And um, for those of you on the call that follow this, you know full well that um, uh, this is a dynamic area. Uh, it's quickly changing, and I think for the practitioner, um, we need to stay on top of um, these emerging trust laws. Um, and unequivocally, in almost all the publications, the four trust, the four states that you see there, South Dakota, Delaware, Nevada, and Alaska, they are consistently considered what they call top-tier jurisdiction, particularly by Trust in the States magazine, but also uh, law review articles and, uh, and other pub publications. And we're going to talk briefly in a moment about the various factors that are looked at um, when this determination is made. And I'm going to hit on a couple of the topics, <clears throat> and then we're going to shift the conversation to more of a, of a focus on taxation. Because there are trends developing in the United States, particularly in the area of taxation of trusts and retained income in trusts, uh, that make this jurisdiction selection even more important um, because to make an incorrect trust jurisdiction selection uh, can have actually some pretty measurable um, uh, consequences relative to taxation that's levied on the trust. So I think uh, over, again, over the last 18 months to two years, we've seen this develop. Um, I'm excited about the topic and, and have become increasingly passionate about making sure that, that um, practitioners know that there is a difference among the states, particularly with respect to taxation, and we, and we will certainly get there. 
So the factors that are generally considered when determining what is a top tier trust jurisdiction, these are factors that that folks at the at Trust in Estates magazine look at, lawyers, accountants, um, people who are really concerned about finding the the best trust jurisdiction, and um, and in the order of how we're going to look at them quickly is asset protection, uh, taxation, privacy rules, um, rule against perpetuities, which is a, a way of saying dynasty trust, and modern trust laws. These areas, these six areas, um, or five areas, they're, they're looked at in a way that, um, and, and analyzed and, and compared from state to state. So, for example, not every state has asset protection. Not every state does not tax. Not every state has any privacy rules and so on. But even among those states that have these components about, uh, are in their trust law, um, even among those states, some are better than others. And so we're going to cover that um, somewhat briefly and, and go through some of these topics and then, as I said, transition into the taxation piece uh, and, and into an area that I think is, is growing and emerging and becoming quite compelling. So asset protection briefly, the Domestic Asset Protection Trust has, has been around for, for many years and it continues to be a hot topic. Um, in the United States, uh, the uh, Domestic Asset Protection Trust really provides an alternative than, to going offshore. Um, why that's important, and I realize how important that was as I was in Europe uh, last month, is um, often, and particularly now, the, the international jurisdictions um, where you've heard in the past at like Cook Islands or Bahamas or, or maybe even Nevis or others, um, practitioners are becoming nervous about placing assets there uh, for a myriad of reasons, some of which have to do with the stability of the government. And you know, the United States, uh, particularly Delaware and South Dakota, 20 years ago came to the conclusion, well, why should um, money have to go offshore to enjoy some asset protection? So what's so amazing about, well, amazing is probably a strong word, what's so interesting about asset protection as it applies to the, the Domestic Asset Protection Trust is that it's a self-settled trust, meaning the settler still has a, a, a great deal of control and can take distributions and can, t can take income uh, and, and can enjoy um, some pretty compelling asset protection um, capability. Among the states, they're not created equally. Uh, and very briefly, uh, the main probably point of comparison is what is called the fraudulent conveyance statute, which is really a fancy way of saying look back. And after two years uh, of establishing, properly establishing the trust, uh, two years uh, later, uh, protection vests. And, and in Delaware, it's four years. And that's an important comparison. Um, and it's, it's the reality of when you're looking at these states, which state is better than others in certain topics. Clearly, I think South Dakota and, and Nevada is another one, um, are a little bit ahead in terms of that fraudulent look back. Um, component to it. Now, there's some debate, Tyler, you know, that we across the country, and I, I spent a lot of time in California and New York City with attorneys and, and really, really across the country. And there's some question as to whether or not asset protection works, domestic asset protection even works in the United States. And, you know, the reality is, um, as, as great as that is as, a, as an intellectual um, conversation, there's not a single case at this point that has had this. Um, overturned or otherwise um, shot down an asset protection statute. There are aspects of, of execution or distribute or rather um, um, administration uh, that has made them weak because they weren't handled correctly or there was a fraudulent transfer, but that doesn't mean the statute th themselves are bad or they don't work. It just means that you got to do it correctly. Um, and I say that somewhat tongue in cheek. Uh, that, that's where the failure is and that's where it's incumbent upon a trust company that's doing this work uh, to do it correctly because if you don't, the consequences are the, uh, the pra asset protection will be, will be pierced. Um, so generally, that's we we'll wanted to just touch on that and to be, remember what we're doing. This is just one aspect, one of four or five or six components that um, are looked at to determine which is the best trust jurisdiction. Uh, another aspect is privacy. Um, increasingly, privacy is a very in, important issue for families. Um, I realize that in Europe, how important it is, which has obviously driven so much of uh, uh, so much investable assets and other assets to, to Switzerland over the years. We all know that's changing very quickly. Um, and Switzerland isn't quite the privacy haven or tax haven it, it used to be. Um, and once you remove the privacy and secrecy component to Switzerland, we have international families who are saying, "Well, now what? Now what do we do? Where do we go?" And what we're seeing, quite frankly, is South Dakota has become the choice for international families around the world. And it's because 
well, it's for many reasons, but in this instance, it has a lot to do with its trust privacy provision. South Dakota is the only state uh, in the country right now that has a total seal on records or, or litigation records that are com uh, connected to um, a trust. So what I mean by that is, in most states, when a trust gets involved with litigation or there's a will contest or there's any, anything about that trust that finds its way into the court system, all of that information becomes a matter of public record. It could be discovered. Uh, it can be easy to look up. You can look up beneficiaries, look up asset base. All of that becomes a matter of public record. Well, wealthy family, not, no family wants that information to be part of the, of the record. Um, and as distinguishable from Delaware, which has a similar privacy provision, um, there are two really, really important distinctions there. One, Delaware is dis judged, it's discretionary. So the judge has to agree with you that there is a, uh, a reason to, to seal this record. And for, quite frankly, I understand it's not easy to get a judge to agree to that. And in Delaware, even if you get a judge to, to agree to it, it's only sealed for three years. Well, that's, again, that's a very compelling uh, comparison, whereas South Dakota, it happens as a matter of law. A judge doesn't have the ability to say yes or no. Uh, the judge uh, basically has to seal it because that's what the statute says, and it's sealed forever. A very important distinction and something, again, as I mentioned, that is driving a lot of activity to, um, it, well, around the country, but even internationally. And, and, and Tyler, it really was amazing when we were in Europe how many people um, that we met with, uh, primarily lawyers and accountants, and, and frankly, other trust companies, knew of South Dakota. And they knew of Delaware, but they knew of South Dakota. And they was really the two jurisdictions that we heard a lot of. In fact, in some cases, they knew more about South Dakota and Delaware's capability than a lot of U.S. attorneys, which is, oh. I find, intriguing. Um, one other final component is that Delaware, or rather South Dakota, has something called a quiet trust, which essentially means that uh, the trust uh, does not have to be revealed to uh, beneficiaries after they turn the age of 18. Um, wealthy families really like that. Um, in most states, there's a requirement that a, a beneficiary upon reaching 18 has to start to receive statements and be notified of the trust. But often wealthy families don't like the idea. <laughs> Uh, frankly, of their son or daughter at college receiving a statement that indicates that they're the beneficiary of a $100 million trust. That, that tends to have an impact on, uh, on, on one's uh, d desire and drive to get their education complete, I suppose. Um, so that's another area that has been, again, one of the many factors that are evaluated by experts to determine which trust jurisdiction is the leading trust jurisdiction. Another area generally is, is, is a concept loosely, I guess, defined as modern trust laws. Um, these are pretty exciting laws that, that, that exist in, in these progressive trust jurisdictions, particularly the four that we've already mentioned. Um, I'm not going to go into specific detail um, now, um, but the idea of having a trust protector statute, having a directed trust statute, um, the ability to reform and decant, and let's, let's pause on decanting for a second. Decanting is something we're going to talk about later, but is a very revolutionary concept in, in trust planning right now. Um, but when you look at all of these concepts, and we're not going to, not for purposes of today, we're not going to get into the details um, because I want to spend most of our time talking about taxation. Um, but when you look at all of these modern trust laws that are available, again, only in a handful of states, it delivers far more control uh, to the beneficiaries, to settlers, uh, co-trustees than ever before. And it really has, uh, and I use this word a lot in the context of trust, which is funny, but it has revolutionized the, the trust industry. And I was just with an attorney yesterday in New York City, a chair of a, of a, of a trust um, of a trust in the states group at a 500 plus law firm. And we both were very passionate about the fact that th this these modern trust laws have changed so dramatically the context of what is an irrevocable trust. Uh, I think 20 years ago, an irrevocable trust mean, meant something very, very different, very rigid, uh, unchangeable, unmovable, uh, and uh, and was something, frankly, a lot of wealthy families didn't really like because they didn't want to give up as much control. You know, fast forward 20 years, Tyler, and I could tell you it is an entirely different world, and, and it, was, you know, it was great to be with, with, with attorneys who see that as well, who use these, these, these trust laws. Um, but again, we're going to focus a little bit more on decanting. I'm happy to answer questions by any, you know, from anybody on the call if they want to get into some of these other, other topics. Um, but again, the focus is really more on, on what's what's emerged here in the in the space uh, relative to um, to taxation. Um, a word about the trust protector uh, the, the, before we move on. The trust protector is also a pretty new concept. More and more states have that provision. Uh, the trust protector is uh, acts as a super trustee. 
which is to say they have a lot of power to remove the trust uh, the trustee uh, which would be a Bridgeford they could remove Bridgeford very quickly they can move jurisdiction very very easily um, which is something we're going to talk about a little, in a little while about how easy it is to move these trusts into a more progressive jurisdiction um, and uh, that's become a, a very common um, tool, but not every state has a directed trust, or rather has a trust protector statute. Um, Pennsylvania recently put one in place, um, but most states, surprisingly, Tyler, don't have that trust protector statute in place. Um, the directed trust versus a delegated trust, um, that is worth a little bit of time, I'm realizing, because it's kind of drive a little bit more of this conversation. The directed trust clears the way for investment managers to work uh, with independent trust companies uh, and, and bifurcates those roles. Why that's important is because some of the wealthiest families in the, in the country and in the world really are kind of tired of the bundled, bundled approach, which is to say a bank of New York Mellon or a PNC or a Wilmington Trust or Wells Fargo. When you go there, they're going to be your inv investment manager and your um, trust company. Uh, the, the, the functions are bundled together. Um, why that's not a conflict, I don't know, but the functions are bundled together. And what's happened in the last 15 or 18 years is that um, this idea of a director trust splits it apart. And that's what Bridgeford does, Tyler. We, we don't manage money. We focus specifically on the administrative pieces. There are trust companies like ours that have, that have uh, developed, and it really gives a, infinitely more control to the settlers and the beneficiaries to be able to work with the investment advisors um, that they want. Um, and those factors, um, and as we've gone through them, whether there's a directed trust statute whether in the context of modern trust laws, trust protectors, uh, whether there's asset protection, whether there's privacy, whether there's a dynasty trust capability, these are all things that are considered. And so what, what, what I'd like to do before we transition into the, into the taxation um, part of this conversation is do a little bit of a comparison now of these factors and get a sense for where the states really fall. So if we go to the next slide, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, well, I guess we will in a moment. Um, the idea of a dynasty trust uh, is uh, a, a very, very um, important development in the United States. And um, sometimes, Tyler, I'm surprised by how, how few people know about what is a dynasty trust. Um, South Dakota was the first state in the United States to abolish this very arcane rule that came from England called the Rule Against Perpetuities. And I know I have friends on the call from that had gone to law school around the country, and uh, I, I'm sure they remember, like me, just how impossible it was to understand this rule uh, called the Rule Against Perpetuities. And essentially, what that rule says is that if a trust uh, is, uh, well, a trust has to terminate at some point. Uh, the, the fancy legal jargon I was forced to memorize, and I'm not going to repeat it now, but although I stood, so, something to do with a life and being and things that nobody really understood in law school. Um, but the point is, it, it triggered a termination of the trust at some point in the future based on the life of a life and being. Okay, once we remove the, the, the legal mumbo jumbo from that, what did practically, what does that mean? It meant that at some point in the future, at some generational point in the future, that trust was going to be terminated, and then what happens? It means it's subjected to federal income tax. And for very wealthy families um, wanting to carry on their legacy over multiple generations and avoid federal income tax, which, as we all know, is, is pretty painful, uh, when you cross the thresholds of, uh, of the exemptions and things, um, that was a problem. And so South Dakota decided, well, because it's state-driven, it's very important to understand this. In fact, I, I, at the point I probably should have made earlier, and I'm sure most people on the webinar know, these, these, all of these laws we're talking about, they're all state-specific. The states have the power to make their own laws, and they have the, the power to, to set up their, their trust laws the way they want to, which is going to be a theme we're going to talk about towards the end of the, the presentation relative to some case law. But the idea of taking the, the, this trust and saying, listen, the rule against perpetuities is gone, the trust can live forever, that means clearly that that trust will never be subjected to, to federal income tax uh, through the estate uh, process. And that cleared the way for cre the creation of a dynasty trust. Now, a lot of states across the country um, have um, changed their laws to be dynasty trust states. Um, and, there's, there, and we'll see in a moment, um, 
the amount of states in the United States who have, have gotten to the point of abolishing or modifying the rule against perpetuities. Not a lot of states have completely, um, um, completely abolished it. Um, some just have made the term longer. So usually it was 21 years is what most statutes were. Um, sometimes they extend them to 50 or 100 years. Um, but there are a handful of states that don't, don't have it at all. And so what we're going to do now in, in, a, in a minute is, is go to a chart that was prepared um, that takes dynasty trust states, which is to say states that have a dynasty trust capability or, in other words, have abolished or modified the rule against perpetuities, and it compares them. And what it does is sets us up nicely to transition into the tax discussion because really the dynasty trust is the first tax play that we're talking about. I mean, we're, we're, what, what we've now transitioned to is, is the idea of, taxations of taxation of trust and, and what, what, is it, what does it matter um, and, and how does it matter. And so what, what we're going to do now is compare the dynasty's trust states and then we're going to get into a more specific, of, a specific conversation of, um, of, the, uh, of the taxation of trust. Um, you know, Tyler, if we can go one more, I think. Here we go, and then we'll go back. This is a chart that may be a little difficult to look at, um, and it's put together, I mean, difficult to see. Maybe if you can make it a little, um, the same way we can make it a little bigger. It's the fourth annual um, Dan Dynasty Trust Rankings chart. There's an attorney in Nevada who's extremely prolific and spends a lot of time putting, um, I spend a lot of time analyzing the various trusts to determine which is the best trust jurisdiction. And we're going we're gonna to hear about him some more later on in the presentation. But he, like me, is extremely passionate about um, trust jurisdiction and making sure we're looking at the right, the right jurisdictions when we're trying to plan. And what he does is he puts together a, a very powerful rubric here. And it's very objective, and that's why I like it so much. And he assigns values to... To various aspects, and, and you know what you'll, you'll what you'll see at the top there, Tyler is is really kind of a, a recitation of what of what I've already covered. Whether the state has uh, abolished or, or somehow modified the rule against perpetuities, um, whether there's a state income tax, and this is where we're, that's where we're heading next. Um, whether there's a domestic asset protection, whether they have a trust decanting statute. Uh, in place. These are all concepts that I, I alluded to earlier, and these are all factors, as I've said, that go into the, the conversation, which is to say, which is the best trust jurisdiction. He has put the South Dakota as the number one dynasty trust jurisdiction when you gather together and compare all of these various uh, components. Again, I like it because it's objective, and it's even more credible, in my view, because Steve Oceans is a Nevada attorney. And, uh, and uh, it would have been very easy for him to say that South Dakota uh, was second and Nevada was first here, but, but he didn't. And, um, and I think this chart is very instructive. And I think it's a compelling tool for practitioners to, uh, to take a, a, closer, a closer look at. Um, so as I said earlier, just because states have these laws or these provisions, as we've gone through at the earlier part of the presentation, doesn't mean, however, that that's all you need to worry about as a practitioner or particularly as a client. What you should be concerned about is, okay, well, how do they compare to one another? And what's so great about this chart is it really puts it all together uh, into, into a nice, neat way. Can we go back to the previous slide? So as we talked about, um, the, the beauty of the dynasty trust is that it avoids taxation uh, forever and there's never a forced distribution. Uh, it, and it's, it, this is an extraordinary important uh, planning tool for families because the, over generations, not only do they not want the taxation, I mean, so that, that's part of it and that drives part of it. What they really want to be able to do is control this thing um, and control their legacy forever. And we hear the, the, the sort of the comment, well, you know, we want to control from the grave and, and so on and so forth. But, you know, first and second generation wealth creators, they want to make sure this money's around forever. And if there's a forced distribution at some time certain down the road, then they've lost all the control. Money's outright distributed, distributed to the family, and that creates a, a really serious problem. Uh, can create a serious problem because when we're talking about net people with hundreds of millions of dollars of net worth, the last thing they want to have happen is that money to be distributed outright to a, to a generation. Because as we all know, and this and what's been driven, uh, what, what has driven these changes is if you look at families like the Kennedys and the Rockefellers and some of these extremely wealthy families in the country, statistically, 
it's there's no question that by the time third generation gets to the money and usually before this law before for this rule usually it's outright distribution it destroys that generation meaning they they can't handle the money um incidences of drug and alcohol abuse are are, are outrageous and um money is squandered and they call you know, there's a book written from uh, i guess shirt sleeve to shirt sleeve which which chronicles how this you know, families could have a worth a billion dollars and then three generations later it's gone uh, and it's it's sad to see that. Um, I think this dynasty trust piece uh, allows that to live forever. And I'm I'm organizing it in the context of trust uh, of trust taxation. So when we take a dynasty trust concept and then we couple it with um, what we're going to talk about next about taxation of trusts, um, you really begin to see Tyler a, a, a tremendous planning opportunity. And what I had said earlier, which was the reference to the chart, you know, these dynasty trust states are not created equally, and that's why it's really, really important to stay on top of the changes. And you know, before before we move on to the really the meat of the presentation, it's fascinating to watch how quickly the states are moving in this regard. It, you know, trust it's big business to to attract trust companies to to um, to uh, their state, and. Um, States like South Dakota and Nevada particularly have been extremely um, aggressive in, in sort of fighting it out year over year. And Alaska, too, where they see something that South Dakota did or, or Nevada has changed, and the next year South Dakota changes it, and they and they and each year they, they sort of they're trying to move faster and faster uh, to the uh, to being the best trust jurisdiction. And you know, I would argue, frankly, I think that maybe the top two trust jurisdictions now are probably Nevada and South Dakota. Um, they they're very similar. Uh, their their asset protection statutes are, are very very similar. Um, probably the main main difference is that a lot uh, the Nevada allows for the uh, you can you can there's an exemption for spouses and um, uh, and child support. So that's to say you can protect uh, uh, your assets from having to be distributed to pay your spouse and child during a divorce. I don't see South Dakota changing their law anytime soon to do that. And frankly, I'm not sure I would want to work with a client that has that as a goal anyway. But that's really the main main distinction. But I'm setting the stage for the next next piece of, of this conversation, um, which really gets into the heart of taxation in government. So trust taxation. For years, uh, a, a this concept of income tax obviously has been around forever, and there's been a handful of states, as the chart pointed out, that has that do not have a state income tax at all. So it's South Dakota, Nevada, Alaska, and a couple of other states, and I'm going to show you a chart in a moment that uh, that kind of chronicles all the states and where they fall in this. Um, this idea of taxing a trust, though, and, and most of these trusts are irrevocable trusts or grantor or non-grantor trusts, they're taxed as a separate entity, which means they're their own EIN, their own person, legally, so to speak, and they're subjected to taxation. And, of course, we all understand that what's distributed from a, what's distributed out of, I should say, what's distributed out of a trust is, um, the is always going to be taxable, Tyler. So if you have a trust and and it's, you you get a ten dollars from the trust or a million dollars, that's taxable at ordinary income. So when I'm not talking about that taxation, taxation I'm talking about is this, the, the 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 trust uh, or the taxation that's levied on retained income, income that stays inside the trust. And what a lot of folks don't realize is that not all states tax these trusts, and um, to select. Or, or think about putting your trust in a jurisdiction that does not tax trust can have some very compelling tax consequences. So when you couple this with the dynasty trust provisions, which means that the trust can live forever, we can create a scenario, Tyler, where a trust can live forever, literally, and never pay state income tax on undistributed income. And these a lot of trusts, particularly at the current generation, don't distribute. That Those trusts are in to live in perpetuity or forever for the benefit of future generations. So if you have a $50 million trust sitting in a jurisdiction that doesn't tax at the trust level, and it sits there for 100 years, that adds up to a tremendous amount of money. And what what I what I say in the last bullet point there is it's it's an untapped planning opportunity in our view, um, by virtue of just um, a lot of practitioners not realizing it or thinking their 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 the home state is going to end up taxing it anyway. And this is where it becomes really exciting, Tyler, 
is that there is, uh, and we'll get to it in a second, but there, increasingly there's support that, that is saying that that can't happen anymore. So, as we say, it's an it's a untapped opportunity by simply combining the dynasty trust component um, in a jurisdiction that does not tax trusts at the state level uh, is um, extraordinarily powerful uh, and something that we've become pretty passionate about here at Bridgeford. So, yeah, this is going to be hard to see. I apologize, everybody. But um, this is another chart put together by, by Steve Oceans. What this does is it talks about, um, it doesn't really rank uh, the states. It just lists all the states in the United States and their states and their, and, their, and their tax rates. Okay, And I think it's important just to focus on a couple of the states. We do a lot of work with California residents. And as you all know, these the, the, the tax bracket there, or tax brackets there, are pretty pretty out of control, and and there's a lot of movement right now to figure out how to avoid taxation. And a lot of people are actually leaving California. Well, there's a way to to, to avoid at least the taxation on the trust, um, on undistributed income on the trust, and uh, and that's where I think we're seeing the most activity, uh, because there's such a big reason to get these trusts out of South, or rather, out, rather out of California into a jurisdiction like South Dakota. Um, but you look at, you know, uh, Pennsylvania. It's it's less onerous. It's three percent, a little over three percent. New York, it's eight point eight two. Of course, New York's a whole different animal. We'll get to that in a moment. But but the point is, I I want to want to sort of underscore the the importance of this. If we can figure out a way to avoid the this type of taxation on undistributed income inside of a trust, and we can do so by simply just finding the, the correct trust jurisdiction to place the trust, um, Tyler, I mean you, you would agree that that has tremendous consequences across generations and and protects these assets. Um, I don't mean asset protection from creditors. I mean it, it protects these assets from taxation, and obviously it's going to make them compound and grow and have more there for the family. Um, so the rules are tricky, and um, what I want to focus on now is probably the most important aspect, I, I would say, of, of, of our conversation together today. We need to define a few things. Um, we need to, de to define a few things. To, b oh, before sure. you continue to define those things, Dave, I, I, and maybe this will kind of be a segue into what you're going to get into. So, so as you've highlighted, we're talking, you know, potentially millions of dollars that could be, you know, taken out of a trust per se due to taxation. So, if I'm a, a trust owner in California, am I going to have to move to South Dakota? Am I going to have to move to Florida? You know, am I going to have to? you know, root up my whole family and go to one of these states with, um, you know, no income tax or, or better income tax just to, to save uh, millions of dollars for, for the trust? Or, you know, how does that play out? That's a great point. Not, not at all. And that's, I think, the most exciting aspect of, of what we're doing here. Remember, I had mentioned, and thanks for the question. It's a great question. The the trust is a separate entity. It's a, it's a separate legal entity from you which has uh, its own life, so to speak. And that's sort of, a, they call that legal fiction. You know, the, the law created a separate entity. So by moving the trust, uh, we should be able to accomplish that. And I'm going to talk to you now about the specifics and what the case law says in that respect. But no, you do not have to move, and that's the beauty of it. Uh, and that's where um, our system of individual state rights really comes to play here. And, and we're going to talk about a constitutional issue, two of them, that apply to this analysis. So thank you, Tyler. But you know, to get to before we get there, this is, it is a great segue because we want to talk about, first of all, what is a resident trust? A resident trust is just what, what you asked about. Tyler, you can set up a trust in South Dakota or Delaware and be a resident of Pennsylvania and um, have beneficiaries in Pennsylvania. Um, but if that trust is properly administered and assets are not within Pennsylvania, that trust is under the jurisdiction of South Dakota or Delaware. What's compelling about that is we know those two states don't tax the trust, as I've been talking about. So herein lies the fight that has existed. States until very recently have been taxing those trusts anyway. And they would say to you, Tyler, hey, look, I don't care where that trust is. You're here and your beneficiaries are here. We're taxing that trust at the at undistributed, undistributed income level. 
Well, as you can imagine, you know, we have some very wealthy families who didn't accept that as an answer. So what we're seeing is a tremendous, uh, I believe, and I, this, is, this is more my analysis, I think, than anything. I, I've seen in the last 18 months uh, a clear trend in case law across the country um, that I want to talk about, not only for folks to see the trend, but also to feel comfortable doing this type of planning. Because what the, what the conclusion is that, that we believe at Bridgeford and a lot of the practitioners is that, in fact, states can't tax these trusts anymore. Um, and we'll get to why. But before we get to sort of that analysis, I need to make a very, very critical distinction. Because it's, it's a distinction that we're going to talk about a, a little bit more detail when we look at the cases. And it involves source versus non-sourced und undistributed income. So if we're talking about... Uh, a trust and let's say it's a 50 million dollar trust and inside of it is real estate and closely held business stock of a Pennsylvania entity or New Jersey entity or California entity the case law and the analysis turns on well one could argue and the taxation authorities have have argued this that that's state specific sourced income and that therefore should be subjected to taxation as opposed to non-sourced undistributed trust income. And here's where it gets exciting, in my opinion. <laughs> Everybody laughs when I say that, but it really does. It gets exciting because the cases have made a distinction. Non-sourced income is considered to apply to investment management accounts. So if, we, if, if you have a $50 million trust and it's, it's in a relationship, it's with an um, asset manager, even if they're located in Pennsylvania or California or the state you're from, that does not establish that the undistributed, undistributed income is sourced in that state. So I'll be more specific. Because of the fact that an investment manager custodies assets literally all over the world, they can't specifically be attributed to income in a particular state where you are, Tyler. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And that's what generally has been determined by the cases is you can't, you can't really prove that a portfolio that's generating 8%, 10% and that's undistributed really is happening in California or Pennsylvania because, again, those assets are custodied everywhere or nowhere or in a cloud or on a computer somewhere. They're not, you're not, they're not sitting in, your, in the investment manager's vault in Pennsylvania or California or New Jersey. So that's a very critical distinction. And frankly, most of the assets that are in play in a lot of these old trusts are investable assets. So now that we've sort of set that framework, let's, let's go to the next slide. So here's what's exciting. I, 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 it's very clear that at least three states that I know of right now at the appellate court level have held that it's unconstitutional for a state to tax a resident trust that's properly cited and administered in another state. It's unconstitutional. It's saying it's a violation of the Commerce Clause because they don't have jurisdiction. Pennsylvania doesn't have jurisdiction. California doesn't have jurisdiction over, over the assets because it's a trust that's properly administered and cited in a jurisdiction that does not tax. Um, it's a violation of due process. All three of these cases have said this, you use the same analysis. And they all came out relatively close to each other. Pennsylvania was the first case to actually, and again, this is appellate, appellate level cases. And it's kind of, it's funny because people hear me talk all the time. I don't, I think Pennsylvania is one of the worst states when it comes to uh, trust jurisdiction. I uh, hope that doesn't offend anybody, but I'm sure if you're on this call, we already know that. Um, but this McNeil case, it was really groundbreaking because it, it definitively made distinctions that said, listen, sourced income in the United States, er, in Pennsylvania, yeah, that's, that still can be taxed. So that's real estate and that's closely held stock. But these investment management accounts, as I've already described, and distinguished, can't be taxed. Uh, at least, and I'm talking about the undistributed income. And it does a very nice analysis. And so not only has this case been embraced locally, when I mean local, I mean in Pennsylvania, um, it's been embraced by the, by the um, Department of Revenue in Pennsylvania. So they've promulgated guidelines around this case to tell practitioners when they're doing trust tax returns how to do it. 
And at Bridgeford, we have um, we we rely on McConley and Asbury to do a lot of these, and um, we have somebody at, who's who's a, who's a very a great technician, Angela and Angela Ducker, who has gone through and done the analysis and pulled the regulations. And in fact, this has been embraced by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. It's not going to be appealed to the the, the, um, this, the uh, Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. And to me, the issue is done. And what's that? What's happening is for practitioners that understand that now, and it's taken a little while, I think, for people to embrace it at the planning level, by simply moving a trust uh, into a jurisdiction like South Dakota or or, or D- Delaware that doesn't tax trust and it's investable assets. Overnight, you can save the trust three percent on undistributed income. Overnight, which more than justifies any additional fee in, in inherent in trying to in having to get a corporate trustee involved to to make that happen. So the case in, in New Jersey, very, very similar case, uh, very similar fact pattern, and, and the analysis is, is virtually identical. They cite the U.S. Constitution, and they talk about due process and, and the Commerce Clause being violated by state to tax the trust. And, and then the most recent one is not the North Carolina uh, case. And so there's clearly a trend here that's happening, and um, I feel more and more comfortable as, I, as, we, as we talk to folks around the country of, of making the claim, look, you can feel confident, even in states that don't have this court, uh, these court cases in place, that this is the trend. This is what's happening in the country. And it raises a very interesting question for those of you, and I know we have people on the call from New York State. Um, you know, New York State has become very aggressive in the last two years, as, as my friends in New York know, of, of trying to shut down these you know, tax, you know, I use the word scheme, but it isn't really a scheme, it's tax planning, and trying to basically say that a lot of these different maneuvers um, aren't going to work and we don't care and New York's going to tax anyway and you know, that's the way it goes. Well, I am very intrigued to see what happens over the next two years. I have to believe that some wealthy family somewhere is going to challenge those rulings and those new rules, relatively new rules, in New York as unconstitutional. And at the appellate level and other states around the country, um, to have some, some pre- it's not totally precedential and binding in New York, of course, because every state's different, but there is this trend that can't be ignored, and I think it's just a matter of time before New York is going to be overturned on some of that stuff. Um, a lot of people watch California, and they're wondering if California is going to go the same way as, as, as New York has, has, has and being very aggressive and sort of shutting down some of this stuff and basically saying, we don't care, we're going to tax anyway. Um, but they haven't yet. Uh, they've had plenty of opportunity to do so. Um, they know that trusts are leaving California, which is a problem because they have, they have all kinds of revenue crises right now. Um, but I believe that, that California are looking at, is aware of the trend and saying, okay, we could try to change our, our, our rulings or our, our approach rather at the trust tax level. But ultimately, there's a very powerful constitutional argument here. And so for the lawyers and the accountants on the call or anybody on the call, it's it's this very intriguing sort of intellectually, but more practically, it opens the door for a very, very, very important and easy to do planning move to save significant taxation. So as we're talking about and have been talking about, there's really a compelling opportunity here to to combine the, the dynasty trusts uh, tax avoidance, uh, well, avoidance is probably the wrong word, tax um, mitigation relative to uh, state taxation for the life of the trust, or rather, I'm sorry, federal taxation for the life of the trust, and then to combine that with the states that don't tax trusts at all, um, it's, pretty, it's, it's pretty compelling. And I keep using that word on purpose because it's hard to ignore this. It's hard to now know this as a practitioner and not look to an alternative trust jurisdiction, as we've been talking about. Um, I, I don't know how uh, a practitioner who, who now sees that this is a, an opportunity and understands the, the case law doesn't look outside of Pennsylvania or New York State or California or any, any other state that taxes. Um, and the opportunity to create these trusts in these stra- in these trusts, or rather, these trusts in these states, or even more important, to move trusts, which is something we're going to talk about how to do that in a minute, uh, just p- presents a very substantial um, opportunity to impact the value of trust assets over over generations. Um, Dave, we've talked a lot today about um, you know obviously all all these different aspects as they relate to trusts and taxation of trusts. And, and we've really kind of focused on uh, the United States and, and the different states here. Um, and you've recently spent time in Europe. We have some international callers on the presentation today. So I know I'm curious, and I'm sure some of our listeners are curious. Are you seeing an interest from the international community to bringing or settling trusts here in the United States? 
Absolutely. And, you know, our friends on the international, I mean, our friends from the international community, I met with, with many of them. And in fact, I learned this from many of them. We have some folks, I think, from London on the call who who enlightened me. A absolutely. For, for two reasons. One, there's more and more connection to the United States that next generation um, ha is having. They want People want to be in the United States. So you have uh, families in Asia, you have families all around the world who have their sons or daughters come here for school and then they become U.S. citizens. Uh, and then there's really no reason at all for the tr their trust to be outside, outside the United States. So they have looked very hard themselves across the, across the world at w these trust jurisdiction options. And, and as I said earlier, often um, the, the practitioners in London, and, and we spent a lot of time in Switzerland as well, they already know that South Dakota and Delaware are, are where to be. And, and they're moving, and that's where they're, that's where they're putting these trusts. I can tell you anecdotally, I was, I was stunned in, to, to be in, uh, in Geneva meeting with a, a, a Geneva Trust Company, and they already were getting ready to establish a, a trust powers in South Dakota because they knew that that's where their clients should be when they come to the United States. So it was very enlightening, and so that's the one reason. There's already a, there's already a nexus, so to speak, from the family members. And then you have what is developing, I think, a developing crisis, or maybe it's been around for a while. I just became more aware of it when we were overseas. Is countries like China and and um, a lot of other Asian countries and, and some Latin American countries, extremely wealthy people have a real concern that the government's going to seize their assets. And it's not just a you know a punchline at a cocktail party. I mean, it's particularly in China, there are some there's some real concern that the government one day is going to say, "We'll seize in your bank accounts." And so that is driving a lot of cross-border activity uh, into the United States, uh, at, all over the country, into the Isle of Man, into these different trust jurisdictions. Um, and I, I think, um, again, I learned so much over there. And, and, and those, those two factors are driving a lot of trust into the United States. And then the other aspect of it is, is the United States has become a tax haven, which is pretty crazy to hear. My, I think he's on the call, John Nonamaker. He's a, a very experienced uh, CPA uh, in New York City area. Um, forwarded me an article in Trust Advisor magazine uh, that just came out November 5th that ranks the U.S. as the third top tax haven in the world. I mean, I didn't see that coming, um, and I think that was. I'm really glad that John sent that to me. So that's. I think that's another. That's the third reason. You know, these international families who have interests all over the world are doing a careful analysis of what's happening across the the world, and they say, hey, well, not only is you know SA where my kids want to be, but it's a pretty good tax haven too. So they they're not only moving trust, but they're moving business interests here, uh, and the world is is really quickly changing in that respect. So we talked a little bit about um, setting up the trusts in these jurisdictions, but how to move these trusts. And this, that's where the real opportunity exists because there are so many irrevocable trusts that exist all over the country, all over the world, that would benefit, uh, Tyler, as I said, overnight by a move. And um, you I hope everybody on the call gets the sort of the conclusion here that it's actually much easier than, than most people realize to move these trusts. A lot of states have actually specific provisions that make it very easy to move uh, trust situs. Uh, Pennsylvania's is very easy. You just have to sign off with the beneficiaries, and it's and you can move them, move the trust. We've used that several times. The trust protector, um, who we talked about that concept earlier, trust protector has that power, has the supreme power. So Tyler, if you appoint a trust protector in your trust, and you, and we all agree that South Dakota or Delaware is where they should be. It, it's a stroke of a pen, and it's moved. Jurisdictions move. It, it doesn't, you don't have to go to court. Nobody can challenge it. It just happens. Um, engaging the decanting statute, and I wanted to spend a little time on that, but the, the sort of the, the final move is to petition the court, which is another way of making it happen. But I can tell you, we've never had to do that. We've never had to petition a, a state court to agree to moving uh, a trust for, for no reason. I mean, we, that's just not, that's not uh, the state of the law at this point. And it's much easier to, to do it. Now, decanting, which is uh, something we want to focus on on the next slide, is, is for a lot of people a new concept. It's a little bit controversial, but it allows us to essentially create a new trust. Kind of like pouring a glass of uh, uh, a bottle of wine into a decanter. It's that same concept. You pour assets of an existing trust into a new trust with obviously presumably more desirable and flexible provisions. And one of the biggest things that one of the biggest aspects of the canting is the ability to move jurisdiction. So simply what you do is appoint a, 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 a South Dakota trust company like, like Bridgeford. And then once jurisdiction vests in South Dakota because of that appointment, we use South Dakota's decanting statute and uh, we change the trust and jurisdiction vests. And guess what? Taxation stops immediately. 
uh, in most cases. So um, it's a, another powerful planning tool. I thought it made some sense to mention it in this context of just how easy it is to move these trusts to a more com uh, 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 progressive trust jurisdiction. We are excited about it. We do it in some cases every day of the week when we're as we're moving trusts in. Uh, and it's something that I think um, is still a relatively new concept. Not every state has a decanting statute. Uh, new York, I believe, was the first to have one. Um, South Dakota is, is considered the best right now. And Tyler, if we go to the next slide, it, it, it outlines that. Again, this is Steve Oceans, um, our, the attorney we talked about before. Uh, he analyzes these states that have decanting statutes and, and is pretty clear that South Dakota's is the most flexible and the most robust. Um, there's a 22 or 26 states that now have these um, decanting statutes. But again, just because a state has a decanting statute doesn't mean that it's the best trust jurisdiction or the best statute. So the analysis has to go to the next level and say, okay, I need a decanting state. I need a dynasty trust state. I need an asset protection trust. And then you have to ask the next question, okay, so which is the best of those options? And this uh, chart, again, does a great job of looking at that piece of it. The insurance premium tax is something I'll hit on very quickly because it's very myopic, but in the context of, of taxation of trusts, it can't be ignored. And frankly, I'll admit, Tyler, it was something I was not really aware of when I practiced law and, and even when we were getting ready to launch Bridgeford. In many circumstances, insur large insurance policies are taxed this thing called an insurance premium tax, and it's taxed state by state. And it's basically um, a, a way for uh, states to um, take tax away from a, or tax a, a, an insurance company doing business in their state. Um, it's, it's myopic. And in fact, a lot of folks don't even know it exists, even insurance professionals. Uh, and not only for those of us who know it exists, uh, we don't even know how it's levied, meaning we know somebody's paying that tax. We don't, we, we presume it's being taxed. Uh, um, we presume it's being passed along to the um, insured or the person paying the tax premium, but we, it's often hard to find because, as we all know, those, there's a lot of uh, fine print in those insurance contracts. So, but we, but we know it exists, and we know that in all states, it's between 150 and 250 basis points. That's a lot. And South Dakota, as you can see, is the lowest by far in the nation at eight basis points. That's a big savings. That's a big deal. And while myopic and not applicable in you know, a lot of the situations, um, it's something that uh, I, I am excited about because the practitioner needs to see that, particularly the insurance professional, by simply creating a South Dakota trust and having that trust buy the insurance policy, uh, you can save a lot of money. Now, the question is to whom? Who gets the savings? And, and I have seen illustrations where it is passed to the client. I've seen illustrations where it isn't. Um, regardless, why should anybody have paid, paid more tax than they should, whether it's the insurance company or, or, or whether it's the, uh, <coughs> or whether it's the um, uh, of ultimate uh, customer? It's still, when we're talking about taxation of trust, in, 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 in the aggregate, this is an important aspect of it. And again, there are potential significant savings just by simply having a South Dakota trust purchase, purchase it. So as we wind down and, and, and maybe get, get to a point where we can, can take, some, take some questions, um, I began our conversation today by saying how passionate we are at Bridgeford and, and how passionate practitioners have become around um, the country and the world of, of looking at correct and proper trust jurisdiction. It really does matter today. It didn't matter 20 years ago, but it really matters. And, and the simple example and, and the fo focus of today's conversation on taxation is it isn't just an esoteric issue now. We can measure the damages that exist by choosing an incorrect trust jurisdiction unequivocally. And so having said that, this decision um, is paramount. And as we began, I think is as important uh, as it is to start a... Uh, a, a trust in the first place. Uh, and that's a quote from somebody from Newberger Berman 10, 15 years ago, which I think was, was, was pretty, um, pretty cutting edge at that point. This chart is, is a compilation, compiles and, 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 and combines <coughs> the research of a lot of people. Uh, Steve Oceans is, is cited on here. Um, trust in States Magazine is cited on here. This is a, an objective piece that Bridgeford uh, put together because we are so intrigued by this relative comparison, particularly between Delaware. Uh, in the United States, especially on the East Coast, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a bias a little bit in favor of Delaware. I think most people think when they think asset protection or they think trust plan, they think Delaware is the best trust jurisdiction. When, when in fact, um, Delaware is a great trust jurisdiction, 
um, but I would argue not the best trust jurisdiction. And that's based on the opinion of, of, a, of a lot of people smarter than myself and a lot of research and, and a lot of detailed analysis. And, and if we go through this chart, there's a couple of things that are, that are compelling. We talked about asset protection, and while both states have asset protection, the look back period is is drastically different and frankly has driven a lot of activity to to uh, to Delaware. Both states don't tax uh, the trusts, uh, there's no state taxation, but the privacy provisions are drastically different and I, I think uh, really are, have to be compared when we're looking at these th th distinctions. They both have dynasty trust capability, which means these trusts live forever, and that's great. But if you look at the charts, um, when you look at all the dynasty trust states in the country, um, it's been compared, and as they're compared to one another, South Dakota, as I mentioned, is considered number one. Delaware is considered number six. <laughs> so, I mean, it's not even considered top tier when you compare it to other dynasty trust jurisdictions. Um, they both have different dynasty trust capabilities, and in many other ways they look the same. Um, the, the insurance premium tax is vastly different, and they also don't have something called a special purpose entity, which is a, a way to shield liability for trust protectors. The point here is not at all to, to be disparaging to Delaware. The point is to say that if we were going to be objective in our planning process across the country, we need to look at the objective uh, details and, and the analysis and avoid hyperbole and avoid self-interested statements to say, look, what is the best jurisdiction? And definitively, we can determine that. Um, based on, again, some great research and just the facts. And so um, that's why we're passionate about it. Uh, and I think that every discussion we have and every presentation we're involved in, we, we really want to force the, the issue of looking at this trust jurisdiction issue. Today's focus was more on taxation. Um, I'm happy to take questions about other aspects in the, in the slides that people want to talk about. Um, but I think this taxation issue is only going to become more and more interesting as more and more cases follow, or states rather, follow the trend in the case law. Well, Dave, thank you so much for leading today's uh, webinar. Uh, we have a few announcements before we get into some of the questions that have been asked. So as a reminder, if you are listening to today's presentation and you have any questions, please feel free to use the built-in questions function um, in the webinar software to send us some of your questions. Um, but we do want to thank everyone again for attending today's webinar, which has been brought to you by McConley and Asbury and Bridgeford Trust Company. Um, as a reminder, you will be receiving CPE credit for attending this one-hour webinar. CPE certifications will be sent out via email within the next 15 days. And you'll also be receiving a link to a short survey about today's presentation, and we would really appreciate your feedback. Um, so if you could do that, that would be uh, extremely helpful to us. We will also be posting a copy of today's presentation on both McConley and Asbury's website as well as uh, Bridgeford Trust website. So um, if you're looking for a recap or want to um, catch the presentation again, uh, check out either one of those websites in the next couple days. Uh, we encourage you to join us for our next webinar, which is going to be on December 17th, and it's titled Year-End Accounting Standards Update. This webinar will be hosted by McConley & Asbury partner Janice Snyder, and it will examine the recent activity of the Financial Accounting Standards Board, known as the FASB, and the changes that they have made over the past year. We would be happy to have you join us for this free webinar on December 17th. So again, uh, we do encourage you to submit any questions that you have. You can also... Um, you can see Dave's email address up there. So if you have any other questions after the webinar, we definitely encourage you to um, let him know. So Dave, I don't know if you just want to jump into any of the questions first or, or how you want to do this. We'll, we'll let you tackle it, the first one. All right, so the first question we have um, relates to federal taxation of dynasty trusts. Um, we're just looking for a little bit more information about that and curious about when the trust itself is taxed, but also when are the beneficiaries taxed. And again, this is relating to federal taxation of dynasty trusts. Thanks, Jay, for that question. Um, and that's a, it's a good question. That, that's sort of the beauty of, of this tax planning um, relative to the federal taxation piece of dynasty trusts. The trust assets themselves are never subjected to federal income tax. Uh, until and when they're, um, they're distributed to the beneficiaries. So the idea of being able to keep these trusts encapsulated in, in, in a dynasty trust and there's never the forced distribution means that they, they're, they're, they will, theoret not theoretically, they will in reality never be subjected uh, to federal taxation. Um, the second part of the question, when is the trust taxed? Um, I guess that's really part of the first part. I would argue never, as long as it's not disrupted. And then when are the beneficiaries taxed? And they're taxed, of course, when distributions are made to them. 
Um, so even though these are dynasty trusts and they can live forever, each time, say, Tyler receives a distribution out of his trust, um, we are um, that he's subjected to his ordinary tax rates, whatever that that would be, and and that presents another tax planning opportunity because if we know that in a in a in a state that doesn't tax trusts, un, if doesn't tax undistributed income, there might be a tax play here not to distribute the income for for a couple of years to Tyler if he doesn't need it because all it's going to do is subject it to, to uh, federal and state income tax relative to his ordinary income. And again, that's a decision that we need to make collectively as, a, as an advisor team with attorneys and, and, and accountants. All right. And thank you so much for answering that question, Dave. Um, again, if you guys have any other questions or want to contact Dave at any point um, about taxation of trusts or trust jurisdiction, asset protection, modern trust laws, any of the above or anything that we've discussed um, in, in today's webinar, um, you can see his email is there and we encourage you um, t to let him know. Also, feel free to visit uh, Bridgeford's website, which is bridgefordtrust.com. Uh, a lot of helpful articles and more information about uh, South Dakota and the benefits of um, working with Bridgeford Trust. So Dave, thank you again for joining us today. you have any last words for any listeners still out there? Not at all. Please feel free to contact us uh, with any questions. As I hope was evident, we're passionate about these discussions and are happy to help in any way we can. All righty. Thank you guys thank you for listening again and for have a great day. for this presentation produced by McConley and Asbury. We hope you join us and participate in our upcoming events. You can stay up to date with news and learn about our upcoming events by visiting us at www.macpas.com. Thanks again and have a great day.